1984, a group of friends inspired by the new wave of British heavy metal decided to form a band of their own. Their main influence was the British heavy metal band Venom, who had just released an album titled Black Metal. They took the name from one of Venom's songs titled Mayhem with Mercy. They even took stage names as Venom had done. Jarn Stewart, the bassist, chose Necro Butcher. Shethil Manheim, the drummer, took his last name Manheim. And Eustin Orset, the guitarist, took Euronymous, which means in Greek for the Prince of Death. How prophetic this name would be, the young Eustin had no idea. Nor did the world of what was to become Norwegian black metal. <laughs> Started as uh, all other bands do, I guess. A couple of friends have the same musical interests, and uh, more. We were more than only f more than fans. We played instruments too, so we decided to start a band. So the the old story, you might say. What we were trying to do uh, within our universe, with our expression, our expression was of course heavy metal, and. Uh, uh, we wanted to do something really aggressive, dark, uh, and uh, take the music genre uh, to the extreme. Uh, and um, I guess the most influential bands that we listened to, that that drove us, or that benchmarked us through to get to the more extreme, uh, was bands like Slayer, um, Celtic Frost. Well, I think that we learned to play our instruments while uh, rehearsing with Mayhem. So it's a progression, musically, uh, instrumental-wise, all the time, even today. Um, we start, I think we started more like a, a punk band, you know. Uh, not playing punk, but like Venom covers, Small Thread covers. And then uh, started to write our own music. Uh, building the image of Mayhem, building the satanic ex expression has always been uh, intrigued people uh, or offended people. And it's of course what a lot of people think of when name Mayhem comes up or, or Norwegian black metal comes up. Um, and uh, of course, if you look into what kind of literature that made us interested in that kind of expression, uh, it would be works from Alice Crowley, uh, um, kind of nocturnal, uh, dark uh, texts, but but not as I, it's not like I read Poe and and decided to to go dark and aggressive in music, but of course that was a part of our swear, and uh, and we also liked the goth. Uh, expression, uh, vampires, the dark, the, the, the kind of romantic style uh, that uh, that goes around that. I would say that it was a lifestyle. Um, yeah. It wasn't a lifestyle that we actually um, uh, decided to dress up in because it didn't it didn't exist. So it just became what different people that was involved in it at the time. Uh, decided to wear, decided to, to, to use as symbols or, or um, uh, effects around uh, the theatrical part of, of, of the genre, which is, of course, dark, satanic, uh, crosses, etc. Much the same as heavy metal had done for ages. Uh, we just took it a bit further. After several months of intense rehearsals, the band released a demo tape, the now legendary Pure Fucking Armageddon. This was traded through the underground metal network, which at the time was just in its infancy. We did a lot of recording actually, uh, because in the back in the, this is before the internet for, for viewers who can try to imagine that, and probably a lot of viewers can imagine because they lived at that time. But we, did, we didn't have uh, a good distribution net, we didn't have this network, this global network, so we were 
Uh, we were bound to, to, to uh, send letters and uh, cassette tapes, uh, videos, uh, etc. Uh, and of course that had to be recorded. Uh, and we did a lot of recording uh, in, the, in, in the rehearsal uh, room. And uh, I think we produced, you probably know this better than I do, but I, I think it's three. Uh, one was pure fucking Armageddon, that was, that was a late one. Uh, we had one before that with, with Go and, and, and a couple of other uh, rarities. And uh, then we had two demo tapes that were close to Death Crush. I think one was actually the Death Crush uh, score. The band had big ideas from day one. They even traveled to Germany and England to promote the rough demo tapes. There's a lot of rehearsal tapes, and, and we sent it uh, back and forth all over the uh, world, and, and it was great fun. And we also got uh, tapes from from uh, different bands around uh, Napalm Death, uh, Sepultura, uh, bands just forming, uh, looking for uh, something uh, that was unique and something that was quite quite uh, aggressive. Uh, so uh, Mayhem was we were not alone in the world trying to do something unique uh, at that time. As the band had no permanent vocalist or frontman, they used two friends as session singers, Billy Messiah and Sven Air Christensen with the name Maniac. At that time, we, it was a small community, uh, but Norway is a small country, so we tend to notice where the interesting people are for us. Uh, I guess that goes with any interest you have. You, you find a few people that share that specific interest. And um, we were kind of loud about what we were doing. Uh, we were talking about being the best band in the world, uh, not even having one uh, song written. So, of course, people heard about us and was kind of interested in what this project was all about. So, uh, so uh, Billy showed up um, through that network, just visiting, listening to our rehearsal. And uh, he played in a band, and um, we were told that he was kind of good, and uh, we tried him out, and he was. And that's 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 Billy. Uh, he's a strange, funny guy, and very likable guy, actually. And today, I think he's. Uh, I know he's running a, a business up in, at Lille Hammer, uh, doing a pub and doing concerts. And he's a lovable guy. Maniac was. <laughs> was a maniac. <laughs> uh, the, the, the artist's name follows the person uh, in this issue. He was he was um, so full of ideas, uh, so full of energy. Uh, I'm sure that the doctor will have a diagnosis on him uh, today as uh, a hyper child or whatever. But. Uh, uh, he was he was so full of energy and so full of ideas. In April of 1986, they had their first gig in Machine, and now the band began to really shape. And Mayhem's name was in hundreds of underground magazines worldwide. I guess the concert is special in the way that it's recorded. It's on YouTube. I've seen it there. Um, it's. Um, it's the first time that black metal expression, as, as I know it, was exposed on stage. And uh, pretty bad, of course. A lot of loose ends. There were no pig's heads or anything on that stage. But it was crosses and it was red light. It was uh, aggression. It was uh, the, the makeup, uh, everything. Of course, Eustan showed his ass to the audience which is a classical, it's a classic. 1987 was the year that Mayhem was truly to arrive onto the metal scene, with the self-released mini-album Death Crush. The young guitarist Euronymous went to Germany again to contact Konrad Schnitzler, a musician from Tangerine Dream. They too became friends and Schnitzler later sent Mayhem a piece of music that they could use on the Death Crush album. Still, 20 years later, the piece Sylvester on the phone is instantly recognizable as the Mayhem introduction. Uh, so I think the Death Curse was very 
primitive, but it was it was something there. You know, it was, we had our own sound, we had our own expression, and uh, just been building on that ever since. made the cover ourselves and um, it was supposed to be red and it was supposed to be you know kind of cool came back pink and with lots of missing uh, stuff so we had to sit down and uh, it was just a thousand copies of course so it wasn't that much but it was some nights we were sitting there and and of course uh, I used to was the, the steady hand so he, he filled in all the things that that uh, didn't uh, need to uh, that needed to be to be uh, aligned with the, the printers and stuff, and then we numbered it all because well we're sitting there with each other. Let's give it a number. So that's why the first thousands are uh, numbered. After so many years, and I was doing a lot of things. I wasn't just a drummer in May, and I did other stuff too. And uh, to me, May was the main band. That was that was where I developed myself. Um, but after so many years, and we're returning 18, uh, it was about time to do some decision. I felt like Death Crush was, it was a, an artistic success. To me, that was more than enough. I was never interested in being a rock star. Uh, I was never interested in touring around Europe. Uh, and besides, at that point, so, who knew what Mayhem could be? Or uh, We didn't know anything. Uh, actually, the only thing we knew was that there was a lot of people around the world that really liked us. And uh, we had fans down in Japan who had tattooed Mayhem logo on their shoulder blades, but we thought that they were kind of crazy people. Uh, we never thought that black metal as such uh, should become uh, what it later became uh, as a genre. You can imagine, you've been working on the same songs, and there's not many of them, but it's the same songs that you've been working for three or four years, every night. And we're not that Christian, so we did have a rehearsal on, on Christmas Day too. You know, it was every day, every available time, it was Maya. We continue rehearse with our vocalist. Um, then uh, Malnheim choose to quit the band and uh, we got uh, Hellhammer on drums 1988. At the same time we got in touch with uh, a Swede called Pelle uh, from a band called Morbid. <clears throat> from a band called Morbid. was laid upon the band as soon as he arrived. He called himself dead. Things were about to become very ugly for Mayhem and all involved the black metal scene. He sent me a tape with his band and a letter and a crucified mouse. I remember I had a pickup track at the time and uh, I picked up the mail at our post office. And, uh, 
the mouths had started to disintegrate, so it was starting to smell a little bit. So I put the leather and the, the dead mouse in the back of the truck and uh, put the, the tape in, the, in my uh, car stereo. Of course the leather blew away, but luckily I read written down his address on the tape itself, so uh, kind of funny, funny story. And uh, we decided to, or he decided, he would come over and join us. That was, uh, I think it was about around Christmas time in 1988, 87, 88. At this point, Mayhem had a permanent singer, but still they continued the search for a new drummer to complete the group. It was a friend of uh, Öystein <coughs> that had a demo tape from uh, Hellhammer when he was playing drums. And uh, then um, they hooked up and uh, Öystein drove Hellhammer out of my place and left him there for, you know, so, so that we could talk. So. Uh, Yeah, we ended up uh, taking all kind of the, all kind of drugs and everything that I had uh, <laughs> that evening. And of course, he was hired. And uh, I, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, he was out playing football with the kids in his uh, stockings uh, outside the, the block of flats I lived. And uh, you know, I knew that he was the man for the job. So, uh, very crazy guy. He is from the mountains uh, in Norway, a place called Trysil, kind of. Uh, in the middle of nowhere. Dad was living on welfare in Norway and was living in a house in Krokstad, a small village outside Oslo. Mayhem used this house as a rehearsal and as a meeting place. After some time, the other group members realized how odd Dad really was. Dad was uh, uh, a thinker and uh, he was uh, quite quiet as a person, a lot of uh, black humor in him, and uh, he was also, uh, he had, uh, he was a great artist actually, uh, combined his uh, black humor with, uh, with drawings and came up with a lot of good drawings, <clears throat> and also uh, wrote very good lyrics, I think, very deep lyrics because it was lyrics that he it was personal for him and um, well you know tracks like life eternal and uh, freezing moon you know when he dies and fall after the freezing moon and uh, he was suicidal already from childhood <clears throat> when he had a near-death experience after uh, ice skating accident. He had tripped and fell on the ice while uh, ice skating and uh, his uh, milk had sprung open. He was rushed to the hospital and he was dead at arrival but they kind of got him back to life. And then he remembered the tunnel and was very fascinated about this. And he was only 10 years old at that time. So after that uh, it was, uh, you know, at the, the, the his path was kind of, that was his path made. Um, I'm not sure I knew Pella, the other Pella. Dead Pella we knew very well, and I guess the whole world, uh, which are interested in Mayhem or in black metal in general, they know uh, the image of, of Dead in Mayhem and his lyrics and, and what he stood for. But uh, the private peddler was a strange guy. The first time I met him, I, was, I, I got angry because I'm a kind of light-minded. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying life. He did not, <laughs> really did not. He was kind of depressed. I do think that the real peddler was a great part of dead, the figure dead. I do think that, but not in the extreme way, but uh, but he, that's, that was something he, he just dressed up and, and became, but he was also that on a regular daily basis. 
he slept with dead birds under his bed because he wanted to smell death. And uh, it was an image. Uh, he was depressed. He was looking for death. He, he was different in all ways. I was fascinated by his stories about... Uh, uh, he had some visions about uh, an afterlife and uh, uh, I think most of his lyrics are also based on those visions. Like for instance cats, he was not fond of cats at all and he, he hated cats so if a cat came to the mayhem host at that time he had a spear outside and he wanted to just uh, kill it as soon as possible so he went out straight from his bed and tried to hunt it down and kill it but I never think he succeeded in it <laughs> and it, it was this other um, dark personality with him um, he thought he didn't belong in this world like he uh, was meant to be another place um, uh, maybe another dimension maybe another world I do not know but um, uh, so the dark sides of him, uh, it's uh, dif different things. With this new lineup, the band took a new direction. This to ultimate the black metal concept. Mayhem recorded two studio tracks, Carnage and Freezing Moon. They had to start to write all the lyrics from their upcoming album, The Mysterious Dom Sabana. The band played their first show in five years. The new vocalist appeared on stage smeared in black and white face paint and shredded rotten clothes like he had just crawled out of a grave. He liked the skinny look. He, uh, it was a part of the, the, the whole uh, thing, uh, the concept, the dead concept. You know, a dead person should be pretty skinny, you know, and uh, with his corpse paint, which wasn't a corpse paint that he did to look cool like Kiss or look evil like King Diamond, it was more like to look dead. You know, it would draw snore down his, uh, from his mouth and uh, stuff like that. And uh, also another thing that he did was he used to usually bury... <coughs> his uh, stage clothes and let them uh, lay in the ground for a couple of days to get that rotten soil you know to get the, the, the process of the, the rotting process into the fabrics that he had on stage while performing also uh, dead animals was a big thing for him uh, he used to collect dead animals that he found you know like dead squirrels dead the birds and stuff like that. We kept them, and uh, in front of some concerts and stuff, he brought these dead animals in a plastic bag and inhaled, as he said, the dead stench before going on stage to have the right feeling of death, the smell of death too. You know, so uh, he tried to, you know, to keep his concept. Uh, To be as quiet as he was uh, private, uh, when he was on stage he acted out his role totally and, um, and uh, he was a great uh, performer, he was pretty wild, uh, but only in, uh, in a sense that he lived himself into his lyrics and uh, when you sing about death and torture and stuff like that uh, well, 
you can imagine that, uh, the, what you look like on stage. Dead had a tendency to self-mutilate and would cut his arms badly at each show, letting the blood drip on the audience. In 1990, this kind of performance was unheard of. At some concerts, the band brought pig heads in pale on spikes. After a couple of songs, Dead started to throw the pig heads at the audience. Many left in disgust. We did uh, two shows in Norway with that. One in Esvarm and one in Sarpsborg. The Esvarm gig was uh, done by a friend of mine that had a radio station. And it was uh, the only reason why we did it was uh, it was a Christian radio station, and they were against um, uh, alcohol. <clears throat> so they had this campaign against alcohol. So we turned that into a party for alcohol, and we were kind of to fuck them a little bit, uh, and uh, that was kind of. We saw the potential of the humor in it, and that's why we did that show. The second one was in Salzburg. A friend of mine has a magazine called uh, Slayer Magazine, and uh, every time he releases uh, mag the magazine, he is in financial problems to get it printed, and uh, he wanted us to uh, to uh, do a gig to uh, get up to, uh, or raise the money for for the printing of. Uh, I think it was his fifth issue or something. Many years have passed as a funeral. Many ages ago. Performance. Why? Good, interesting. Kirk himself and doing all these things that have not been done in Norway before. I think that he had uh, the ability to do it, and uh, he had the audience to do it in front of. And I think that he liked to see how people reacted when he cut himself up, you know. So, after that we did uh, three gigs in uh, East Germany, or former East Germany, because of, they just uh, tear down the Berlin Wall the year before, and a uh, gig in uh, Turkey. Well, uh, this was uh, back in the days where uh, this kind of music was pretty fresh, you know, 1990, and uh, we were probably the first extreme band to come to Turkey, and I knew it would be a problem. But uh, we did it anyway, and uh, did it by rail. And uh, I remember that the dead was bleeding nosebleed. He was nosebleeding the whole time on the train for 12 hours, and we got to the border, and uh, we had to jump out, yeah. got all our equipment thrown out of the of the train and uh, there was a lot of shit going on in the end uh, we were so fucking pissed off by the whole thing 
that we uh, ended up uh, getting uh, arrested or at least I got handcuffed and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, also uh, they cut uh, the, the show off the four songs. So there was a lot of journalists there. And uh, since we were pissed off when the gig was cancelled or when they cut the, uh, cut the power, we were just screaming, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, dirty, shitty people, you know. And uh, so um, I heard sometime afterwards that people had been on vacation in this place called Ismir, a holiday place down there that uh, they still talk about it and uh, the crazy blokes from uh, Norway and Sweden when they came down and yeah but uh, we after that decided never to play in Turkey again because uh, well take a look at the toilets you know but I think it's a settle. After the tour with Mayhem Dead got even more bizarre. He told Hellhammer that he had bought a new knife, a very sharp one. Hellhammer didn't bother Pelle's words, but on the 8th of April in 1991, the reason of purchase was inevitable. Dead wrote his suicide note and the lyrics for the song Life Eternal, and then cut his wrist and his throat. He walked around his house bleeding, but decided to finish it off with a shotgun. The other members thought Pelle had no humor, but at the ending in the suicide note he wrote, ironically, Excuse all the blood. Hieronymus, who found the body, didn't call the police. Instead, he did the unthinkable. It was uh, a strange thing really because um, I myself had started to long for summer. This was in April and the sun had just come back to Norway after a long and hard winter. And I was I had a feeling of you know that spring in me and uh, that time, Ted uh, decided to take his own life. You know. <clears throat> and first of all, that was that was the first feeling. And after that, of course, losing a good friend, uh, and I was in grief uh, for a long time over that. It was a great loss to me. Uh, uh, unfortunately, my uh, guitarist didn't feel it like that. He uh, and Dad were. Well, kind of. Well, they were not friends in the end, and since they were living together, got on each other's nerves and stuff. And uh, so uh, that particular weekend, Oystein was out of town, and uh, he called me because he couldn't get into the house and wondered if Dad was at my place. And I said no. And he said, well, he's probably hanging in his room. By meaning hanging in his room, meaning that he killed himself. So I was thinking maybe to go out there that Saturday and uh, see if he, see was, see if everything was okay. But I decided not to do that. And the day after, uh, he uh, bust, uh, Euron was, I stand, called me and uh, said that, uh, well, he found his dead body and shit. But he had taken some photos of the dead body. So. Uh, I told him to uh, get rid of the photos before he could contact me again. It was not a, a relationship between ordinary friends. Um, if, I, if you're going to be mean, you can say that Einstein put Pelle into his project. Because at that time, Necro also quit the band. Uh, or decided not to be active and uh, 
uh, and Penla and Einstein were living alone uh, and Einstein had his project and his project was taking dimensions way beyond what we uh, had thought of. It was kind of, he was, his daily life was a totally theatre. Uh, everything was staged around this archetype of Euronymous and mayhem and black metal culture, uh, trying to be the one who defined everything into it. Uh, the death of Pelle did nothing to calm down the now almost megalomaniac Euronymous. It was on a pure death trip. Phoning, writing and even posting parts of the skull to selected comrades worldwide. This is a point in the story where Mayhem plunged into sheer madness. My well, first reaction when he told me about it was, he told about it when he, he, he phoned me about Pella's uh, death. I was, of course, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked, but I didn't like what I heard. I couldn't understand why he did it. Um, later, I didn't mind much. Uh, it was, it's actually, it is a minor detail. Uh, people tend to make it uh, a big thing, uh, but it's just a big thing if it gets used in some way or another. And uh, so I wasn't that angry about the pictures. Not the skull bits either, uh, for that kind of matter, but what it did afterwards with the photos, I reacted to. On one of the photos, which is obviously staged afterwards by Euronymous, the knife is carefully laid over the shotgun. It was Euronymous' intention to publicize the band by using the photos on flyers. This never actually happened, but one of the photos did find its way onto the cover of the bootleg album Dawn of the Black Hearts. Euronymous even claimed that he ate parts of dead brain to proclaim himself as a cannibal. Euronymous didn't for one moment consider stopping mayhem. However, Necrobutcher left almost immediately, wanting nothing to do with his friend's insane acts. A replacement was quickly recruited from a local obscure band. He would take over bass and vocals. His name was Occultus. Veronimus told me that they wanted a new bass player and a vocalist, and that's it. They've been writing letters for a while before that. Well, he was uh, a kind of a person that... Uh, uh, well, he had strong opinions about things, but uh, uh, he, he never used to drink, so it was uh, kind of why uh, he um, got his message out in a uh, different way, not in the city and to people in that way, but uh, uh, he had strong opinions about uh, things that uh, uh, st stick to him for his life. And, um, uh, well, yeah. Uh, not sure what more to say about uh, his uh, his lifestyle. It was uh, uh, unusual, but uh, a kind of interesting way of life, actually. In the meantime, a live album was released by the Italian label Obscure Plasma. This would be a lasting tribute to Dead, and was also keeping the name Mayhem in the now disgusted public eye. Euronymous opened his own record store in Oslo, which he named Helvete, the Norwegian word for hell. Uh, it was back in 1991, and uh, it was the first of its kind in Norway. Uh, I wanted to create something uh, related to the black metal music and uh, heavy metal also, in uh, what all that concerns. Um, we painted the walls black for the very first moment, uh, because we liked it that way. and. Uh, um, I think it was a good idea because it was the first shop of its kind in Norway and uh, I've heard later on uh, there's been shops uh, um, influenced by Helvete being made in uh, USA and other countries. So, um, uh, well, it was an interesting period of my life. It was a wild time actually. It was uh, uh, a party time, most of the time also. Um, me and Trash, we used to buy a couple of beers in the morning and uh, uh, we, we had black humor, we had bizarre humor, we had crazy humor, so what's written on the flyers, no fun, that's definitely wrong. <laughs> Things later start to go wrong between Occultus and Euronymous. The usual death threats and inner conflicts between Mayhem members was once again on the rise. 
Euronymous sent Occultus a death threat, and Occultus left mayhem. Euronymous, the record label, Death Like Silence Production, a label that was to sign some of the most prominent black metal bands of the time, such as Abruptum, Psy, Enslaved, and was now actually beginning to grow. With the help of a new rival on the scene, Vari Vikanis from Bergen, was impressed Euronymous with his primitive raw project, Bursum. I was introduced to, 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 uh, to Christian, or Vari, or whatever, um, when he was coming over from Bergen and uh, he stayed a couple of days at Zaystan and uh, he had this Bersin project. I do have the original first copy of Bersin here. If you want to buy it, you can get it. Um, so just kidding. Um, I, I disliked the person and I disliked his music. I'm sorry to say. Uh, he was not a person I liked. And, uh, I think, I still think that Bersin is the hype, uh, it's totally, it's, it's shite, that's my honest opinion, and, um, but I still disagree, he really liked it, I can understand why he liked it, because it was, it, he wasn't that fascinated by the music, I think, more of the, the project around this Christian type of figure, because it was, one man show doing everything himself and with all these ideas about the darkness and aggression. He was, he was buzzwording a lot to say the, the right things. And uh, I was then taking his wings around Vodik uh, and, and uh, defending him and uh, promoting him, uh, doing everything available for him so that he could uh, put it out. Oysen was, of course, interested in the money or to, to actually be, he, he tried to build an industry around uh, giving out records of the right sort of bands, the, the real bands, not all the rubbish around the real bands. Vari Vikines was full of big ideas and had already recorded several albums worth of material. In order to get maximum publicity for Bursum, Vari hit an idea like no other. He declared a personal war against Christianity not only in words, but as an act. Churches started to burn down to the ground. Vare took a photo from one of the burnt down churches and used it on his album, Aske. The headlines gained from the church fires forced Euronymous to close Televita, but still he saw himself as the leader of these called satanic terrorists. Vare, however, had another opinion. Besides Euronymous' death-like silence label, the band Mayhem was still active. Since there now only were two members left, Euronymous let Vari be the new bassist. Euronymous got in contact with a bizarre character from Hungary to do the vocals on the album. His name was Attila. Eisten uh, Aronemos, the guitarist of Mayhem by the time, he reached me. Um, via this guy and uh, it was first time I heard about actually Mayhem and uh, at the same time about the idea that uh, if I could join maybe to the band and uh, sing for uh, their album. The vocals were a bit uh, experimental, I know. I mean People probably would expect, you know, the screaming vocals uh, like that uh, laid down before. But, uh, you know, when we were in the studio and uh, also in the rehearsals, but especially in the studio, we just tried different ways. So the others really like this kind of vocals, this dark, uh, a little bit melodic, but still uh, really dark. and evil alien kind of vocal so I asked for a curtain and black room with candles everything it was nice atmosphere so that was cool the album the mysterious Dum Satanas was now recorded but still a dispute between Vari and Euronymous grew Euronymous didn't like he always did send a death threat to Vari on the night of the 10th of August, 1993, the dispute reached its climax. 
Yes, it's interesting because uh, so far we were together, <laughs> we were really okay, I think. So he was another kind of guy, of course, and uh, he was younger and uh, he was also seemed to me a really intelligent guy, really clean and sharp minded and sharp way of thinking and really spinning, you know, active. And uh, at the same time he was calm too, so it was not a big shouting, you know, and big arguments at least at that time. So that's why it's a bit uh, confusing, you know, the whole thing and what happened later and uh, especially for me it was kind of shocking new, you know, because I didn't expect that. So. in Hungary, you know, and uh, I just lost all contacts suddenly. And Vadi made a visit at Geronimus' apartment, and on the pretext of wanting to discuss the contract related to Bursum, he convinced him to open the door. The argument that ensued became more and more heated until Vadi pursued it and knife and stabbed Euronymous. Euronymous attempted to escape, but Vadi chased him, eventually delivering the fatal blow through the head. The knife was so deeply embedded that Vari had to use his foot to lever it out. Euronymous, Prince of Death, and a self-proclaimed leader of the Black Metal Circle, died on the stairs outside his apartment, aged just 25. The next day, the death of Euronymous was headline news in Norway. Mayhem's name was on every news bulletin. The band that had started as a hobby was now a nation nightmare. Well... <clears throat> First, um, first of all, uh, it was a shock to me, and uh, I didn't knew it before. I saw the morning paper that day. And f right then, I didn't know who did it. So I was thinking, shit, they're, maybe they're coming after me too. So I bought a, borrowed a shotgun from a friend uh, first week to feel safe, and then, uh, then I realized what happened. And what happened was that uh, Jörn was signed up a band called Bursum from Bergen and apparently fucked him for money, for rights, and in the end went and camp Wisnack. The one, the guy behind Bursum uh, wanted to leave Death Like Silence Productions. Uh, Jörn must have told him that uh, he owed his four next albums and was kind of laughing in his face about it and then in the end they started to to send death threats in between each other uh, for for uh, Euronymous I think that uh, death threats we he was always like that uh, sending death threats to everybody all the, all the time but was not so much behind it but uh, when you send death threats to uh, to a person like Varg Vikernes, uh, he probably thought better him than me. So he went down and uh, killed him. And I think that's basically, 
if I were in the same shoes, uh, been fucked financially and uh, laughed at, uh, would be pretty pissed off. I can understand it. Sorry that it happened to a friend of mine, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't feel any bad feelings towards uh, what we can lost today. But of course, I lost a good friend again. Everything go back to those who create something. So I don't believe it was very smart. The police had their eye on Vare Vikenes almost immediately. However, he seemed to have an alibi. But this didn't take long to fall apart. The trial of Vare Vikenes was a media circus, the biggest ever trial in Norway. Bursum and mayhem were the words on everybody's lips. Yet Bursum would soon dissolve when the 21-year-old Vare Vikenes, the enigmatic Kjan Krishnak, was giving Norway's longest sentence in history, 21 years. It's very strange, you know, to describe all what you feel in such case because for me at least, or for us, the band is very important and when you play music you put your soul and, and it's some kind of unity what we feel and uh, it's more maybe than a, a simple friendship and we created something together so it's always shit to lose. Uh, friends, but especially in these uh, conditions or surroundings. So, I don't know, it was kind of disappointing for sure. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know, shit can happen still, it seems. I don't know, it was... I didn't follow the, the relationship that much. I don't know when it went from good to bad, or why it went from Good to I know a bit about why, but um, you have to ask, uh, ask the kid himself. He's, he's gone some years now, so he probably, probably not. I've seen some interviews, but he should have thought things through a bit. But when that is said, Oystein was not an innocent person in this story. Uh, of course, no one deserves to get killed. Uh, but of course, Oistan was not a very lovable guy against, uh, towards the people around him. Uh, which, of course, can trigger a kid to do extreme things. In uh, Euronymous's funeral, I talked to Hellhammer and uh, I was already in a band with Maniac at the time. We started, uh, we had a band called Flesh Wounds at the time. And uh, we decided to try to find a new guitarist to continue. And we searched for one year and then we found a bloke uh, called Rune, calls himself Blasphemer. He was very young, was 19 years old, but he had all the potential. He was as crazy as us, so he fitted the crew. And uh, he's been making the songs since uh, 1997, and we are very happy with the way everything is going with him. Mayhem was now back on their feet. They recruited their first session singer, Maniac, who sang on the mini album Death Crush. He had evolved his earlier primitive vocals to a more insane and wicked voice. Mayhem took the world by storm, and they released a mini album titled Wolf's Lair Abyss. Wolf's Lair Abyss is, uh, it reflects our personalities uh, in uh, 1995, 1996, 1997, the years we worked on it and the year it was released. It's a very aggressive uh, record, and uh, like I said, when, I, when it was released, I felt it was very representative for uh, who we were as persons and uh, the, the way we felt at the time. Mayhem hadn't played live since the days when Dead was in the band, and they made their first concert in seven years. 
a place in the middle of nowhere in Germany. Mayhem started to grow again as a band, thanks to the great guitarist Blasphemer. He had different views than other guitarists amongst the Norwegian black metal scene. And Mayhem, who always had one step ahead, started in the year 2000 to create one of the most complex albums out to date, The Grand Declaration of War. <laughs> even close to what the expectations were from fans, and if you compare it with previous albums, you would think that the Grand Declaration of War should be very aggressive, but instead Mayhem made a concept album. The Grand Declaration of War is more, uh, more well thought of, uh, not, uh, not that aggressive maybe, but uh, more well thought about, more well composed. Mayhem worked together with the Norwegian artist René M. Hummel, the artist behind Space Brain, and he designed the whole concept and visualized the look of Mayhem's futuristic war theme. Because of Mayhem's new concept, some fans turned their backs against them, but even so, this was one of Mayhem's most creative times with writing and recording new music. In 2004, Mayhem and their frustrated guitarist Blasphemer recorded Chimera. from Grand Declaration of War, but in a different way, not uh, the uh, not a progressive way, like not uh, technically that uh, complex, maybe more simplistic uh, in a way, but still very complex. Uh, and the thing is that since everybody's been fucking with us all the time. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's the reason why we maintain this aggressivity within the band. Um, you can see it in all the bands, like the Rolling Stones with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, where they hate each other, you know, and when they hated each other the most, and when Keith Richards did the most drugs, the greatest albums came out. Same thing with Paul McCartney and John Lennon, same thing with drummer and police and sting so on so on so on and we have two two strong individuals going two different ways and creating a t tension in the, in the band that's when the magic comes up and especially with a, an aggressive band like mayhem it really comes up to the surface and uh, that's what we real uh, releases and uh, after this album release, Mayhem toured frequently, and this constant concept with music, alcohol and drugs wore the lead singer Maniac slowly down. Uh, that was, uh, <coughs> that was, um, I would say that he wasn't kicked out, he was more like, um, he had a problem, 
the problem became bigger and bigger and bigger. He, in the end, he had maybe a little bit hard to realize that he had a problem. But uh, when we when we uh, put it down on the knife edge and uh, try to sort out what we're gonna do for the future and what May and we're gonna do uh, like the next six months, he realized that he could not continue. So he was not kicked out, it was more like an understanding between us, us that yeah, he, uh, yeah, he had to leave the band. The last six years I've been in contact with our lot, uh, late, late uh, vocalist Attila, who sang on our uh, album uh, Mysterious Tom Satanas. And we had an ag agreement all the time that uh, we, uh, he would step in if anything happened to Maniac. And about five, six years ago I saw that the Maniac was going down, downhill. So that's also uh, belongs to the story that uh, I was in contact with Mayhem from 98, uh, especially with Necrobatcher, and uh, he, uh, we already kind of agreed that if anything happen, happens, uh, I will be first to be asked to join back, you know, but uh, of course it was an unforeseen thing, nobody, nobody could tell when it will happen, so of course I said, yeah, Nehem is a part of my life, so it's, I, once I belong to there, so I still, I still feel in the family because actually we, that's a good thing that we all the time kept a good relation, so relationship. Mayhem was now back with Hungarian singer Attila, and he wanted a more chaotic structure in the music. Well, of course it's from coming from black metal roots. However, in the beginning it was like brutal black thing. It turns into completely black metal at the mysterious and the wolf layers of this uh, period. Then it comes suddenly into some uh, technocratic clinic uh, <laughs> world for me, you know. And now with Chimera, it's again another time, uh, direction. Um, it's hard to say. Um, I'd, it's extreme metal music played extremely well and extremely unique, I think. It's like a diamond, like a black diamond, like a crystal, and just working on that. You know? And this is how I feel. Mayhem plays extreme music and will always take new paths and directions. Badding new band members, Mayhem will continue to broaden the spectra of black metal. It just uh, tend to be okay, it's working now, so we recorded the new album and uh, that's pretty rusty, pretty dirty as we wanted, it's not polished anymore and kind of uh, uncomfortable finally <laughs> to listen, which is I think good. It's, it's called uh, correctly Ordo Ad Keo and uh, uh, it's uh, it's a compl it has a complex meaning, of course, and it's um, first of all the two words, the order and the chaos, it's two opposition, and order at chaos means order into the chaos or to the chaos or to chaotic structure. It has many meanings, but uh, I think in main like, uh, in mayhem history, it's just like fuck everything and let's go ahead and don't give a shit anymore about anything. Just we want to do what we 
uh, feel to do and since the band is chaotic itself we are different persons and we still play the the same music and uh, and uh, everybody is uh, has their artistic view and everything and uh, and personally I like chaos for me which means a lot of things and a lot of layers so we just ended up to choose this title so everybody liked it and uh, but the, the, actually the structure of the songs here or there kind of chaotic but it's always controlled you know it's always it's never improvised nothing on the album so it's really a structured chaos <laughs> in a way, or chaotic structure maybe. So it's an order and the chaos together and it's, uh, uh, you can project it into many things about the world too, like, uh, like uh, inventing this chaos like uh, and taking control on the world and stuff like that, you know. So, I don't know could have many uh, meaning but I like to leave it open for the people you know I don't like to too much define uh, even titles or lyrics because uh, sometimes they are just coming to me too so, you know I don't want always to explain because then it will limit and uh, I like if the verse has more meanings and more layers you know Uh, we deliver the, the aggressive music and, and then we let the, the other uh, wind bands deliver all the, you know, the ele elevated music. I think that people need uh, to, uh, to have uh, some sort of uh, release of uh, aggression and I think we may and music will deliver that. Releasing aggression and making headlines are one of Mayhem's specialties. In the summer of 2006, they entered the stage of Gates of Metal in Sweden and made a concert beyond what the human society accepts. This continued for several days. As usual, Mayhem brought pig heads and other dead animal parts on stage. We didn't think about the media at all when we did this show. We just uh, thought to, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's this, let's say, this chaotic period of Mayhem that we don't have any well structured. Uh, 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 direction and any rules we should keep, you know. So when this show came, uh, I was just, you know, I was just, we were just thinking what to do and uh, these ideas just came in the very day or the day before about the big things and all the shit, you know, and uh, and I had a few more ideas also, so I just fit together and it looked like we could re uh, realize it. We fixed everything with the festival in advance and I had to tell every details about the show actually even for the stage uh, manager and the security boss and the festival boss. So we told everything and we had this uh, kind of uh, 
show and uh, show elements on stage. But after, of course, uh, it it's included uh, animal parts and stuff. So, but I think it's normal. I may I'm sure it's not the first time you see these kind of things. But then the media pick it up pretty much, and it was just uh, well, it was just a surprise because we thought everything was all right. You know, everything was. Uh, fixed in advance, so actually it was not about making uh, any attention in the media. We just wanted to do a just a cool show. That's it, you know. I, today I hate the media, and uh, uh, I'm in a very good position now because uh, they want us, we don't want them, and uh, give us up as the upper hand. We don't need any more uh, publicity, especially uh, not here in Norway, where we only sell four to five thousand copies anyway. You can jump off the biggest building here in Norway without a parachute, without selling any more records. It was just to to pick up this uh, sensation, and like usually with the media, they try to pick up everything what they can make, you know, impress on the people and sell more, selling more, of course. So I don't know, man. Actually, but I heard about some animal protectors, and but actually it was just like a small thing. They made made it big, or I don't know exactly what happened. There. So, but uh, I'm a friend of the animals personally, so I don't give a shit about what animal protectors saying, <laughs> you know. So that's my point of view. Every now and then, mayhem is touring around the globe, headlining big festivals. They try to make new direction, but they are, and probably always will be, hunted by their dark past. I would think that if Messiah didn't leave us in 1985, we would be the biggest death, trash, black metal band in Europe. We would pro maybe we would have Slayer's role in Europe. So, when thinking about that, in comparison to the press attention we got of the tragedies of the deaths in my band, I don't think that uh, it, it com can come near to, to, to the losses that we had. And we had to start over again with new people all the time. What would have happened with Mayhem without all the, all the fuss? But then again, it's hypothetical because the whole idea when we built Mayhem was to build the story, build the story, to put out rumors, to to never comment rumors. You probably get more comments now than it has been giving out for the past twenty years. Uh, so it was a project. It was a theater. Uh, it was it was more real than a theater, but but I think that would have stuck with uh, Mayhem uh, even without the tragedy. I think the tabloids and the tragedy and the whole thing around Mayhem and a couple of other bands was uh, it was what made black metal Norwegian black black metal legendary. Without it, uh, it probably would be a genre with some interest for some people who were uh, into that type of music or that corner of heavy metal or whatever it would be have called. Uh, I don't think that it would have been uh, that much focus on, on, on the Norwegian black metal scene. And because we had that focus, it's uh, when you when you light the light in the dark, you you, you get all sorts of people coming in, and uh, and uh, in the black metal scene, I think that has been a positive thing. The uh, another uh, shitty thing that uh, the, the police uh, started to focus on uh, on uh, on the scene and the people in the scene, and uh, today I'm uh, constantly on this. So, uh, they are watching me from uh, the secret police. I had a meeting with them four months ago. <laughs> so I never get rid of them after that. And uh, so uh, I try to keep a low yeah, profile, but uh, 
the media in Norway. You know, they... And yeah, we, we are in flames sometimes. It's true. That's the part of the art. So it's very important, I think, uh, that uh, one must have to, have to control, you know. Uh, uh, it's not healthy to lose control. <laughs> This kind of music, or you live in this kind of life. <laughs>